Washington, D.C. is my home away from home. I've worked here for the better part of three decades as a founder entrepreneur, policy expert, and author. Probably the longest title. Um, everybody sort of shortened it to ONC for sanity's Merci- sake. Mercifully. Yeah, mercifully. I've learned leadership secrets from many healthcare executives who understand that Washington is the largest payer and regulator of healthcare. She said, well, because you'll never get a husband if you do that. <laughs> I began interviewing healthcare leaders many years ago because what better way to learn how they think, why they make it to the top, and how they remain there. Think about what was your most challenging engagement? Healthcare has been the most difficult problem. (laughs) (laughs) What did you say? We'll talk about (laughs) that later. Hubert Jolie is best known for his role as CEO of Best Buy's historic turnaround. He shares with us the philosophies behind Best Buy's transformation and explores how to put those ideas into practice. Hubert did not start as the leader he is today. His journey began as a numbers-focused McKinsey analyst. Through his career experience, reflection, and a spiritual journey, Hubert became someone who believes in human magic a term he coined in his new book, The Heart of Business. Human magic starts with focusing on the individual employee. The best motivation is intrinsic, and successful leaders will create environments that foster human connection, individual autonomy, and productive feedback. Successful organizations will structure the opportunity for employees to be able to write themselves into the vision of the enterprise. And the vision for a business should not be the bottom line. Hubert expresses that this new era of capitalism requires that businesses embrace all stakeholders and treat profit as an outcome rather than a goal. Hubert encourages leaders to redefine how they imagine business. He also advises that leaders develop confidence in humility. It's okay not to know all the answers. It's more important to admit your shortcomings and ask for advice. Well, good morning, Hubert, and welcome. Thank you, Gary. We're pleased to have you at this microphone. You've had a remarkably successful career as a leader, and we'd like to learn more about that today and also dig into your experiences at Best Buy, which is one of the most significant turnarounds in business history, and then explore uh, the heart of business, your new book, which I found to be absolutely easy reading, but chock full of information, built in part on lessons learned during the turnaround of Best Buy. And also you're proposing a new era of capitalism that uh, we'll be interested in exploring. And of course, we'll accomplish all of that in five minutes, Uber. <laughs> but why don't we begin to learn a bit about you, what was the young Uber like? What did he think about leadership? Oh, Gary, and I so look forward to our conversation. So what did I think of leadership? I do remember a, a, a time when a friend of my parents, I had said, in answer to a question, I had said, I don't know. And the friend of my parents said, oh, young man, if you're going to be in leadership position, never say this. You know, you have to fetch. And this was the model of the leader as the superhero who knows everything, who is the smartest person in the room and probably tells other people what to do. So very much the 20th century model. And I was very much influenced. I was growing up in France and that was, you know, the, the, the model of leadership. You, when thinking about a CEO, you know, that you would admire, you would say, oh, this one is really brilliant, right? As if it matters. And then I went to the, same, to the best business schools in France uh, I, I joined McKinsey and Company, so I've, I'm very much a product of the leader as the smartest person in the room who knows everything and tells other people what to do, which, of course, is something that I've changed my point of view on over the years, Gary. Uber, as you look back, who was the most influential on the development of your leadership style? Yeah, so, Gary, over the years, I went from this uh, hard-charging, deeply analytical you know, McKinsey consultant to somebody now who believes in human magic and pursuing a noble purpose. So there was several significant influences along the way. Uh, one of them was a client of mine when I was at McKinsey, Jean-Marie de Carpentry, who told me once, I will always remember this, 
You bet the purpose of a company is not to make money. It's an outcome, it's an imperative, but it's not the ultimate purpose. He said there's three imperatives in business. The people imperative need to have the right team. The business imperative need to have customers who are happy. And of course, the financial imperative need to have happy shareholders. But it's excellence on people that leads excellence to uh, on business that leads to excellence on financials. And he said, you need to manage like this. So, for example, to be very concrete, Gary, when you lead a business, a business performance review meeting, start with people, then go to business and finish with financials. If you start with financials, you're going to spend the entire meeting on the numbers and you're going to miss what are the key drivers. And then beyond that, there's this question of why are we in business is the why question. What's the purpose of business? And somehow it has to contribute to the, to the common good, he was saying. So he was a big influence, another big influence with another client uh, who ended up becoming my spiritual director. <laughs> and I had reached the, my first mountain to, uh, you know, quote David Brooks, and I'd been successful. I'd been a partner at McKinsey. I'd, I was on the executive team at Vivendi Universal. But I felt emptiness. And so call this my midlife crisis. This was 20 years ago. And I felt the need to really re-examine my life and discover my calling in life, which I did through the spiritual exercises of uh, Ignatius of Loyola, the founder of the Jesuits. So that was a big milestone. And the third milestone I'll mention was my coach, Marshall Goldsmith, the father of executive coaching in this country, uh, with whom I started to work in 2009. Before that, if somebody had told me, you know, uh, Jack or Mary are working with a coach, I would have said, what's wrong with them? Why are we spending any money you know, <laughs> on, on helping them? And Marshall had specialized in helping successful leaders get better. Who doesn't want to get better? Right? And so Marshall taught me so much. He taught me about uh, accepting feedback, focusing on feet forward. I cannot change the past, but based on what I'm hearing you know, from my colleagues and uh, co-workers, what do, I do, what do I want to decide what I want to get better at? And then asking for help. And then trying to correct all of the quirks I had. This thing about being the smartest person in the room and adding too much value, eh, you know, not helpful. So your role as a leader is much more to create an environment in which others can be their best. So these were three important milestones for me, Gary. And that's really encapsulated as a foundation in, in the book, The Heart of Business, which we'll get to in a bit. But why don't we turn to Best Buy? What were the circumstances, Uber, that led you to uh, Best Buy? So it was uh, 2012, Gary, and at the time I was the CEO of a, a Minnesota-based company, Carlson uh, Companies, a travel and hospitality company. And in May of this year, I get a call from my friend Jim Citrin, who is a senior partner at Spencer Stewart, who does a lot of the CEO searches, you know, Jim. And uh, at the time, I was, for a variety of reasons, I was open to leaving Carlson, but my reaction to Jim's call was, Jim, you're crazy, right? I know nothing about retail. And Best Buy, yes, used to be an amazing company, but it's now a mess. You know, everybody thinks they're going to die. Why are you calling me? And he said, well, you know, they're not looking for a retailer because they have plenty of retailers in-house. They're looking for somebody who's going to take a fresh look and effectuate a turnaround. And you've got great turnaround experience. So do me a favor. Take a look. And whatever Jim tells me to do in life is a dear friend I tend to do. So I took a look and... I saw, Gary, that uh, contrary to what was written, <laughs> the world needed Best Buy. Uh, as customers for certain of our purchases, we need Best Buy you know, to touch and feel and see the products, uh, ask questions. And importantly, the vendors needed Best Buy. They needed a place where to showcase the fruit of their billions of dollars of R&D investment. So this was good news. The other piece of good news is all of the problems that Best Buy had at the time were self-inflicted. Prices were too high. The online shopping experience was mediocre. Speed of shipping was slow. The customer experience in the stores had deteriorated and the cost structure was bloated. That's good news because if you have self-inflicted problems, you know, I, I didn't need to blame Jeff Bezos or, or anybody else. It, it was, the problem is us. So, uh, so that convinced me that uh, 
we had enough assets to be able to effectuate a turnaround. So given the fact that the problem was Best Buy's and there was some sense of your ability to influence that or even control that, how did you gain the buy-in from the Best Buy leadership team? Yeah, this, this was an extraordinary time. The advice I was getting from the outside was cut, 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 right? Close stores, fire a lot of people as if people were the problem. And no, we were the problem. So, you know, the, the, how did I gain the trust? First thing is I came with, you know, uh, my two ears. <laughs> You'll notice that everybody has Best Buy has two ears and just one mouth. So to listen, and I spent my first week on the job working in a store in St. Cloud, Minnesota to learn from the frontliners, right? You know, whether it's a retailer or a hospital system, you know, the truth is on the front line. Uh, that's one of the things I've learned. You, you cannot discover the truth sitting at your conference table looking at spreadsheets. And the frontliners, Gary, they knew what was going well and what was broken and missing. And so my job was super easy was to listen to them and then do what they had said we needed to do. And so when we did this, of course, that allowed us to gain some credibility. With the team at headquarters, it was a little bit the same, right? Listen to them and take a positive attitude. I told everybody, look, uh, you know, on day one, everybody starts with an A. I don't care what happened, you know, last month or two years. It doesn't matter, right? We cannot change it. Everybody starts with an A. Now, everybody gets to decide how long they're going to keep the A, right? Now, some of them didn't keep the A very long, but that was their decision, not my decision. But by listening and then co-creating the plan and working together. And then the other thing was, so in a turnaround, I have this view, Gary. <laughs> a little bit like uh, IBM in the 1992 when yeah. Lou Gerstner uh, became CEO. He said that the last thing that IBM needs at this point is a vision. We need execution. We had the same at Best Buy. So we didn't start with strategy. We started with fixing what was broken. And so I have this bicycle theory, right? It's really hard to direct a bicycle at standstill, right? You fall. But if the bicycle is moving, it doesn't matter if it's not moving exactly in the right direction because you can course correct. But it creates momentum and creates energy. Uh, and then if something is not working, that's another thing, right? Back to the I don't know, right? Vulnerability. Oh, this one didn't work out as intended. We need to rework this. Be clear, be vulnerable and say, you know, this didn't work out. Transparency is, is our friend. So I'm curious about sequencing. So there must have been a number of things that weren't working as intended. How did you go about sequencing or figuring out what was the most important to do today and then tomorrow and the day after that? Yeah. So the first thing we said is that it's, it's about fixing you know, what's broken as opposed to doing strategy. Within this, going back to my friend Jean-Marie de Carpentrie, we studied with people, giving the frontliners what they needed and making sure we had the right team at the top. The other aspect of sequencing or prioritization, so in a turnaround, you know, back to the cut, cut, cuts, right? Uh, fire a lot of people. No, that's not how we do this. Uh, in a turnaround, I think the number one priority is see how you can grow the revenue. Because it's amazing what revenue growth can do. As we need to cost, and we need to tackle costs as well, focus first on what I call non-salary expenses, okay? which is everything in the cost structure that has nothing to do with people, which at most companies is the vast majority of the cost structure. As an example, you know, at Best Buy, we sell a lot of TVs, right? They are large, they are thin, so they break. We would break... Gary, for about $200 million worth of TVs every year. Wow. And we did a survey, right? Exactly 0% of customers wanted to buy a broken TV. Right? <laughs> so if you can reduce the breakage or the, the, the TV junk out, as we called it, it's good for the customers and it's good for the, the P&L. And you treat headcount reduction only as a last resort, right? And so that's the other thing. The last thing I would say, it's about creating energy. In physics, uh, we, we learned that uh, energy is a finite quantity, right? In an organization, that's not true. You can actually create energy. How do you create energy? It's by co-creating the plan, right? Because nobody likes to be told what to do. It's simplifying. So back to your question about priorities. When I was in the store in St. Cloud, 
Noska, the store general manager, one of the things he told me when I was listening to him, he said, Hubert, look, you guys are asking us to focus on 41 key performance indicators. He says, I love you guys, but 41, I just can't. Give me a max, you know, five, and I'll do it for you. So we, we landed on two, you know. We said, Best Buy, we only have two problems. Revenue is going down and profit margin is going down. Only two problems, right? It'd be more difficult if we had 10 problems, but two problems, how hard can it be? Right. And so simplifying. Uh, and then in terms of, that's another interesting thing, right? In a turnaround, you don't try to go for perfection. In the book, there's an entire chapter around the quest for perfection is evil. You go for a plan that's good enough. And we took six to eight weeks to do the diagnosis and develop the plan. And then we got going. And, inst you know, if instead of focusing on priority three before priority four, we did four before three, who cares? It doesn't matter, right? So you get going, and that's what creates the energy and so forth. So these are some of the thoughts about how we handled it. You mentioned in the book that feedback was sometimes difficult for you to uh, kind of accept or manage earlier in your career. Can you share with us your thoughts about that, Uber? Yeah, and maybe some of our listeners have had this experience, right? You sit down with your boss, and your boss, who is some kind of God, right, who knows everything, tells you the three things you're doing well and the three things you're not doing well and that you need to address. I've always found this to be draining, right? Because here's the scoop, uh, and we could do a test on your show, right? Raise your hand if you like to be told what to do. I'm going to bet that nobody is raising their hand, no. right? Motivation is intrinsic. And so when I was hearing this feedback, you know, the other thing I was struggling with is, you know, when I would do a 360 <laughs> and somebody would say something I was uh, not doing perfectly, I'd say, what's wrong with them, right? <laughs> As opposed to me. Where Marshall helped me, so when I would get the results, of the 360. Uh, he would first send me a memo with all of the good things. And he says, you better read this, take your time. I'll send you a second memo tomorrow. <laughs> and on the second memo, he told me, look, you don't need to do anything. There's no God that says that, you know, you need to act on any of this. But if you want, you can decide what are one or two or three areas that you want to get better at. And that's a game changer. So he calls this feed forward. And at the end of my tenure, Gary, at Best Buy, um, I, I, st I stopped doing uh, performance reviews for my direct reports. Instead, every six months, they would come to me. And they all had a coach and a 360. And they would do the talking. They would say, okay, these are the things that uh, I'm very proud of. These are things that really worked well. Looking at the last six months, these are maybe a couple of areas where we struggled a little bit or a lot, depending. Looking ahead, these are the things I'd like to get better at. And this is my action plan. And my role in this discussion uh, was, gee, on the first thing, the, the things you're doing uh, well, I think you're shortchanging yourself. You're way better than you think. And then on the last point, which is the action plan, really ask a question, how can I be helpful? Because what I was finding, Gary, is that they knew, right, um, what they were good at and with the, the help of a coach in 360. Uh, and they, did, they didn't need to be told. In fact, you know, the role of the manager is just to tell you what time it, it is at your clock. It's not particularly helpful. And so that was a, a game changer uh, for me first and then for, you know, the, the, the team. And it creates such a positive environment. And if you meet somebody from Best Buy, you can ask them, what are you working on? And they'll say, oh, I'm working on these three things, Gary. Do you have any advice for me? <laughs> uh, it's a very positive uh, mindset. It strikes me, Uber, that you have confidence in yourself as a leader, which is what a change like that would take. Have you run into others that just don't have the confidence in themselves as a leader? They need to have these kind of annual reviews and so on? You say I'm confident, like many, I am an unsecure overachiever, and I'm trying to <laughs> get cured. 
And like many, I suffer from the imposter syndrome. Uh, so if you suffer, if you're listening and if you're suffering from the imposter syndrome, welcome to the club. <laughs> and, and the reason why we suffer from the imposter syndrome is that continuously we're stretching ourselves as leaders. And so we end up doing things that we've not necessarily done before. And so the turnaround of Best Buy have never turned around a major retailer. And certainly today, so maybe we can slow down on this, Gary. In the world we live in, this idea of not saying, I don't know, that's crazy. Did you have the manual for how to deal with COVID, Gary? Probably not. Yeah. Do you have the manual for how to deal with back to the office? No, there's no such thing. And so I think as leaders, we need to be confident to be able to say, gee, that's unprecedented. I don't have the answer, but let's figure it out together. So it's a combination of confidence, but also humility and vulnerability. And my most frequently used phrase these days is my name is Hubert and I need help. Yeah, that that's really enlightened, I would say. Uh, but clearly, as you as you lay out in a book, I think it's it's the coming uh, approach to leadership. One of the reasons that the healthcare uh, community, particularly those in health systems, were so interested in the Best Buy turnaround is because Best Buy, known as big box retailer hospitals, are known as you know big box uh, healthcare deliverers and. There was a lot of uh, affinity to what you were doing there. Uh, you're on the J&J &J board now, but I wondered whether you had any sense, whether you ever, ever heard that before, that there's similarities between these big healthcare institutions and, and big box retailers. So I'm not an expert at this, but I've, I've had the opportunity, maybe because close to Minneapolis, we have Rochester with Mayo Clinic, uh, and I've gotten to know a number of leaders in health systems, healthcare systems. Yeah, there's some similarities um, from the uh, regarding the importance of, I would say, maybe a couple of things. One is, of course, the importance of what happens on the front line. In a hospital system, what happens in the office of the chief administrator is sort of interesting, uh, but it's what happens day to day on the front line with the patients and uh, and so forth. And so, if we can make sure that the frontliners have the tools they need and the environment in which they can be their best, the biggest, most beautiful version of themselves, it makes a big difference. One of the things I've learned, Gary, is that uh, if things are going well, always credit the frontliners. Yep. If things are not going well, look upstairs because upstairs has probably not created the right environment for the frontliners to, uh, to operate. And it's not about top-down management. One of the things I've learned during the Best Buy journey it's been about empathy, and empathy is a word that uh, you know we didn't use that much a few years ago in leadership. But suddenly during COVID, uh, oh my God, right? Being able to have empathy for the frontliners, for the patients, for the employees, and uh, as you create the customer experience in retail, true empathetic leadership, uh, uh, listening, excuse me, to understand the experience and then designing something that's better. That's very powerful. The second thing I would say is about purpose. So of course you could say in health, uh, you know, there's always a good purpose, which is to restore health and whether it's Medtronic or, you know, J&J &J or Mayo Clinic, you know, you, you have a, a noble purpose, but I think it's more than this. It's a couple of things. It's one is how can everybody write themselves into the, you know, their pur the purpose of the enterprise? How can I, how can they connect what drives them individually with their work and how does this work connect with the purpose of the organization? And it's also how you actually define the purpose. One of the things we did at Best Buy, once we had turned around the company and we were working on defining where we wanted to go, was we said, we're actually not a retailer. Yeah, we're certainly not a brick and mortar retailer, but we're not even a retailer. We're in the business, we're in the happiness business, we're in the business of enriching lives through technology by addressing key human needs. Now, of course, that's more inspiring. It's also something that vastly expands the addressable market, right? That's how we have this in-home advisor program where we'll go to your home and we'll be your CTO and 
your CIO for, for, to take to help you take care of everything in, that's in your home. That's also how we got into the health business, uh, helping aging seniors live and stay in their home independently longer by putting sensors into their home and through AI and, and remote monitoring and call centers, care centers, we can trigger an intervention. Now that service is not even sold through our stores, it's sold through insurance companies. But we were able to address that need in le by leveraging our capabilities in support of that purpose. And I think in healthcare, for a health system, it's a little bit the, the same. If you're Mayo Clinic and if you just define your business as what happens in the four walls at Rochester or in Arizona, you're limiting yourself. But you say, no, 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 I'm really in the business of restoring health and helping, you know, wellness. With technology, you know, you can serve patients anywhere in the nation and in the world. And at a time where a number of businesses are under pressure from a revenue standpoint, I think reimagining re the business around that purpose and then mobilizing the entire organization around that noble purpose can be incredibly powerful. So it's for you to decide how applicable this is to health systems, but that's how we went through this uh, at Best Buy. That's well said for sure. Uh, Uber, why don't we tr turn to the heart of business, your new book. You just seem to be a natural teacher. And I could see that uh, an extension of that would be writing the book. So what was the inspiration for writing this book, The Heart of Business? The beginning, I felt that so much of what I had learned in my early years in my career or at business school or as a consultant was either wrong, dated, or incomplete. Uh, and by that, I mean, in particular, a couple of things. One is the idea of shareholder primacy, that the only thing that a company should worry about is profit maximization, like uh, Milton Friedman told us in 1970. And of course, today that's wrong. You know, a business needs to be a force for good, needs to embrace uh, all of the stakeholders and, and treat profit as an outcome. And then the second thing that I think has been poisonous in the last 50 years is what I was talking about earlier, which is top-down management, which Bob McNamara, the former Secretary of, of, of Defense in the 60s sort of created, take a bunch of smart people to create a plan and then communicate a plan and put incentives in place and hope that something happens. And that's really the, the foundation for a lot of the business world for 50 years. And we know that, <laughs> you know, at some point last year, I had to slow down and say out loud, the world we live in is not working, right? We have a health crisis, we have an economic crisis, we have big societal issues. We certainly have racial issues. We have environmental issues. We have geop geopolitical tension. It's not working, right? And what's the definition of madness, right? Uh, doing the same thing and hoping for a different outcome, uh, Albert Einstein. And so I felt that we need this reinvention, this refoundation of business and capitalism around uh, purpose and, and humanity and increasingly you know, people embrace that idea, the business roundtable, you know, the top companies in the country have all signed a declaration in August of 2019 along, along these lines. But we also know that while it's easy to say, it's really hard to do because it requires that we reimagine, you know, pretty much everything about business, how we define strategy, how we define the various functions, how we lead. And I felt that over the last 30 years, and certainly during my time at Best Buy, I had learned notably from others uh, how you know this could work and what it takes to lead from a place of purpose and with humanity. And with the success of the Best Buy turnaround, with the share price going from $11 to now it's around $130, <laughs> maybe you could have done better, Gary, but you know it gives gave me some credibility. And so I wanted to use that platform to share, you know, you know, for people who are eager to move in that direction, what is really a handbook or a manual with many, many concrete examples, practices. At the end of each chapter, there is a self-reflection question. So it's a very practical handbook. It's not, a, it's not per se the story of the Best Buy turnaround. It's really an architecture and a manual to help anybody who is eager to uh, 
move in that direction. I certainly found it that way, uh, very easily readable. And it really is practical in the sense that you can change the way you approach things after reading the book. Question about the need for a broader change, crisis, capitalism, and so on. And you use the term new era of capitalism. How about your CEO colleagues? Uh, I know there's a lot of talk about this, but how many are really committed to change, Uber? I, I am so impressed, Gary, today by the uh, leadership qualities of most CEOs. Uh, you know, boards, when they think about picking a CEO, they now take these factors into account. So for me, uh, and of course, everybody comes in different flavors, right? So that's the beauty and messiness of humanity, right? But I think that the majority of CEOs are convinced that this is the right direction. But the truth is that it's really hard and it takes work on changing ourselves, right? <laughs> we all know these stories about if you change, want to change the world, begin by changing yourself. And during COVID, if you couldn't go outside, you had to go inside and reflect on how you wanted to lead and how you wanted to be remembered as a, as a leader. So there's no shortage of desire. There's a need for, you know, let's invent together a different way to, to make this work. A core part of the book, and it started out the book, is what you call the meaning of work, which is, I think, on virtually everybody's mind today with COVID, with remote working, and in fact, some people couldn't work, and so on, as you're talking to other CEOs about your thesis here, how important is that? And how often does that come up as part of your discussion? It's foundational, this question of why we work and what's our life purpose. At HBS, where I now teach Gary, we, we, we started to do seminars for companies and also we'll do one in January in the MBA program around this idea of how do you put purpose to work and how do you create an environment where you can unleash human magic? And the first part is around, you know, really discussing and reflecting on your life journey, your life story, your crucibles, and your purpose in life. And using a purpose in life as foundation for business purpose. And it's transformational. And, and the question arises because, frankly, work as a mixed reputation, right, is... Is work a punishment or a curse? Right. Because some dude uh, sinned in paradise. In French, Gary, the word uh, work is travail, which comes from Latin tripalium, which is an instrument of torture. So that <laughs> tells you. <me. laughs> oh, is work something you do so that you can do something else that's more fun, like watching the Vikings defeat the Green Bay Packers, which rarely happens, but, you know. It's a... Or is work part of our search for meaning and part of our fulfillment. Now, of course, it's a choice we make, but if we can connect what drives us with the purpose of the corporation, it's transformational. And a very practical implication of that, something that everybody can do next week, uh, is something we did at Best Buy back in 2016, I remember. So every quarter, I would get the uh, executive team together uh, to work on our strategy, our plan, our culture, you know, you name it. And one day, uh, I had to ask every one of the executive team members to come to the offsite with a picture of themselves when they were little, two or three years old. Believe me, we got some really cute pictures, of course. But then over dinner, we spent the evening sharing with each other our life story and our purpose in life. And believe me, you know, this, this was a turning point because we realized two things. One, Every one of the executive team members was a human being, beautiful, but also quirky, messy, you know, uh, not just a CFO or CHRO or CMO, a human being. And two, with a couple of exceptions, all of us shared the same kind of purpose in life, you know, the golden rule, doing something good for other people. And then we reflected and said, look, we're the leadership team of Best Buy. Why don't we use this platform to help fulfill our purpose and to create an organization that employees are going to love, customers are going to love, community is going to love, and shareholders are going to love. And then it becomes much more 
than a job. It becomes part of our calling. And the idea of being curious about the purpose of people around you, I think is a game changer. And I'll just uh, add a quick story around this because this, this is not just for executive teams. That can be at every level. I had a store general manager in Boston. He would ask every one of the associates in his store, what is your dream? At Best Buy or outside of Best Buy, what is your dream? Right? Write it down in the break room and say, my job is to help you achieve your dream. At the time of the great resignation, I think we need a great re-recruiting effort, which starts with empathetic listening and discovering, because I don't think it's rediscovering, it's discovering what really drives people around us, what's their life purpose and their dream in their life. Mm -hmm. I think it's a game changer. And this fits into what you call in the book, the noble purpose, which is, seems to underlie this new era of capitalism. Can you tell us more about your thinking about the noble purpose, please? Yeah, because I think that's, you know, in my vision of business in this new era, it's, it is indeed about pursuing a noble purpose, putting people at the center, embracing all stakeholders in a declaration of interdependence, and treating profit, treating profit as an outcome, not the goal. So what's this noble purpose thing? It's not just a statement you put on your website. For me, you find it at the intersection of four circles. One is what the world needs. Two, what you're passionate about. Three, what you're uniquely capable of doing as an organization. And four, how you can create economic value. And... That's how you define it. It needs to be, you know, meaningful, authentic, credible, but also inspiring. And the beauty of that approach uh, is that, um, of course, it's inspiring. As we discussed, it's also, you know, a way to expand the addressable market. And if you can then align the activities of the company around that, then I think magic happens. But you need to do the work of, you know, making that purpose the cornerstone of the strategy and translating it into specific, very concrete, strategic initiatives, triaging your activities. We all remember when CVS decided to stop selling you know, cigarettes. If their purpose was health, stop selling cigarettes right. and uh, focus on how you're going to be helpful to the health of your, of your customers and then do the work to allow everybody to write themselves in that, pur that purpose. So I think that's a, it's, it's a profound change uh, it's become almost a fad, so there's a danger here. And that's why I think the key is to do the work to make it, uh, to, to do a good job of defining it and then making it come to life. So I could just see a leader coming up to you saying, Uber, I believe in the human magic. What's the first step I take to unleash the human magic and my people? Uh, um yeah, and, and I talk, we talk about the human magic thing because there was a point in the journey at Best Buy where performance started to accelerate and it defied logic. It was too good. And it came when we had managed to unleash that human magic on the front line where people had the spring in their step and without being told would do extraordinary things for, for customers. I think the first step in that human magic journey starts with each of us. And this idea of clarity of our own purpose in life. Right? The second step is to realize that the way the organization is going to mobilize is not by top, through top-down management, right? People, if you, you know, incentives, right? People have relied on incentives. Here's the problem. If you pay, if you use carrots and sticks, you're going to get donkeys, and donkeys don't do a good job, <laughs> neither in retail nor in, in the health system. Right. Uh, so you don't want that. At the same time, if I continue on this metaphor, if you pay peanuts, you'll get monkeys, which is not good enough. So you need to pay people, but that's not the main motivator. So then you need to realize that motivation is intrinsic and comes from within. And so you need to realize that your job as a leader is to, to know how to create that environment. In the book, I talk about five ingredients to this, uh, being French, I get to talk about a recipe, right? Uh, and the five ingredients are about, number one, connecting dreams, which is what we were just talking about, right? Uh, being clear about your purpose, but also understanding the purpose of people around you and how it connects to the work. 
Number two, it's creating an environment where there's genuine human connections, where everybody can be themselves and the best version of themselves. My compatriot, uh, René Descartes of the Cartesian philosophy said, I think, therefore I am. Eh, is wrong. It's I am seen. I am seen. Therefore I am. And it's about vulnerability, right? Creating an environment where, you know, it's okay to say I'm struggling. It's about inclusion, diversity and inclusion. So that's human connection. The third one is around autonomy, creating an environment where people, you know, back to, they don't like to be told what to do. So create an environment where we're clear about the purpose and the principles and, you know, levels of authority. But within that, people can decide what's the best way to do things. It's about gr growth and, and mastery. So helping every one of the team members become a master at what they do. And here's the thing I've learned, Gary, is that uh, size doesn't matter. Whether the organization is 100 people or 100,000 people or a million people, it doesn't matter because it's one individual at a time. And at Best Buy, we, de we develop individualized coaching for 100,000 people on a weekly basis it's about not managing for performance, ironically, but focusing on the drivers and treating performance as an outcome. So easy for a manager to yell and scream at a, an employee because the performance is not good. I can see it if it's not good. You know, Help me create the environment where I can become better. So it's a, mind, a significant mind shift, which as you can feel has massive leadership implications. Hubert, a question about the board of directors of Best Buy during during the turnaround. Did you need to do any um, kind of religious work with them? I mean, did you need to teach them the way you're teaching your your uh, leadership teams? So they were part of the journey, I, and I give so much credit to our board. Together with our head of NomGov, uh, nominating and governance, we redid the board because we, you know, you want a board. That's the best possible board to help steer the company through its transformation. So we looked for the right kind of talent to augment our talent. So people who had significant uh, experience with transformations, you know, in, in tech businesses, in service businesses, uh, and at a variety of, uh, uh, of skills, but also people who were aligned from a value standpoint. And, and let's slow down again here. I think Gary, probably the most important decision we make as leaders is who we put in positions of leadership, who we put in positions of power. And one of the things I've learned over time is, yes, you need the right skills, the right expertise, the right experience, but I was historically spending too much time on this. You also need to be clear about what kind of leader do you want to have? What kind of uh, leadership principles they embrace? And so increasingly over time, whether it's recruiting board members or executives, I try to understand who are they, you know, what kind of a leader do they want to be? How do they want to be remembered? I will always remember that was the best interview question I, I was ever, ever asked when I was being recruited for the CEO job at Carlson. Marilyn, Marilyn Carlson Nelson, the, the daughter of the founder, was interviewing me to be our successor as the CEO of, of the family company ask me, Hubert, tell me about your soul. Who asked this question? And yet, I think as leaders today, we want leaders who are able to lead, I say, with all of their body parts, right? Their brain, but also their heart, their soul, their guts, their ears, their eyes. And so being clear about, you know, what kind of leaders do we want in position of powers, I think is critical. Let me turn this to a question about the board of directors. You're on the J&J &J board, the Ralph Lauren board now. Of course, we're on the Best Buy board. What kind of board member do you want to be? I'm kind of building on what kind of leader do you want to be? And what are the qualities or characteristics of, a, of an excellent board member? I think the, the, the great thing about having been a CEO dealing with the board is that you remember what it's like to be the CEO and the management team dealing with the board. So you don't want to, back to this point, you don't want to tell the CEO what to do, right? It's the last thing you want to do. You want to be really clear about what's the role of the board versus the management team. So it's about making sure we have a strategy that's working, making sure we have the right 
leader and leadership team, making sure that you know we comply so nobody goes to jail. And increasingly, I think, Gary, making sure that the right culture exists at the organization. Um, so you, you, you want to make sure that you focus on the, on the right topics. And then it's a combination of uh, challenge and support. As a CEO, I wanted to give me to, to have a board that would give me hu superhuman powers by augmenting our skills as a management team. And so sometimes that support give us things that we don't have, give us ideas, give us contacts, but also challenge. I loved preparing for the board meetings because it would force us to articulate our strategy and to be better. I found that actually I would get 80% of the value before showing up at the board meeting through the preparation. But then some of the questions, you know, that and the challenges that the board would give us were, and you had to see them as, as uh, not feedback, but feed forward, right? Inputs. Uh, and so th one of the things I've learned from my coach is uh, when a board member or anybody gives you input or feedback, say thank you, <laughs> smile, and shut up. <laughs> and so... You want a chemistry on the board of people who, de who deeply care about the company, who have wisdom, who are not looking for you know a power grab, and have a way to um, navigate at the right level, balancing support and challenge. That's how I would describe it. It's a it's a subtle chemistry. Uber, this has been a just a terrific interview. Very informative. You're an incredibly engaging person. We thank you for your time. I've got one last question, if I could. We have a number of listeners who are earlier stage leaders, one could say up and coming leaders. What advice would you have for them? Ah. I, other, uh, pardon me, other than to take your course at Harvard, of course, but. <laughs> <laughs> or, or other than buy the book, which by the way, all of the proceeds from the book go to my favorite charity, which is the Best Buy Teen Tech Centers that help uh, disadvantaged kids. I've got the book right here. <laughs> <laughs> the heart of business, right? Uh, I think the, the advice, Gary, uh, so remember when we were flying, right, in the old days, um, the steward or stewardess was, would tell us, look, if the oxygen mask comes down, put it on yourself first before you help others. And I think that in this crazy environment, our resilience as leaders is challenged. And so you need to make sure that you take care of yourself so that you can be a great leader. What does that mean concretely? I think that's going to mean, you know, probably exercise, breathe, but also reflection and meditation. And a key question, and I'll leave uh, with this, is how do you want to be remembered one of the exercises we do in the new CEO program at Harvard is we ask the new CEOs to write their retirement speech. And my wonderful wife, Hortense, who is an executive leadership coach, ask, she asked her client, I think it's even better, to write down their eulogy. You know, the thing that people will say on the day you're not here to listen anymore. And I think if you write this down and regularly revisit it, as your North Star. And by the way, being kind to yourself because you're only human, right? So you're not going to be perfect every day, right? So rather ask yourself every day, you know, did I do my best to try and be the leader I want to be? And if the answer is no, that's okay. Don't, don't be harsh on yourself. There's always tomorrow. So try again tomorrow and ask for help. Call Gary and say, Gary, do you have any advice for me on how, on how I can become a better leader. Well said. Uber, this has been delightful. Thank you so much for being with us. The book is terrific. I urge all of our audience to uh, buy it, read it, and act on it. Thank you again, Uber. Thank you, Gary. Thank you. <laughs>